Welcome to Connective Tissue Extracellular Matrix, Fibers, and Ground Substance. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the Histology Wizard. The three components that make up connective tissue proper are cells, fibers, and a hydrated gel-like ground substance. Today, we'll focus on these fibers and ground substance that comprise the extracellular matrix. Unlike other tissue types that are mostly cells, the major component of connective tissue is the extracellular matrix, or ECM. To remind you, the ECM is a complex of non-living macromolecules manufactured by cells and exported by them into the extracellular space, or the space between the cells. The ECM has many functions, many of which we're only beginning to understand. These include modifications of development, morphology, and functions, and survival of cells. The ECM also influences cell migration, mitotic activity of cells, and forms junctional associations with those cells. The variety of connective tissue types in the body reflects differences in compositions of the fibers and ground substance that make up the ECM, and together they are responsible for the structural, functional, and pathological diversity of connective tissue. Fibers give connective tissue the ability to withstand tensile forces, while ground substance resists force of compression. The hydration properties of ground substance permit exchange of nutrients and waste products. Today we'll spend most of our time talking about fibers and then move on to ground substance. The fibers of the ECM provide both tensile strength and elasticity to this tissue. Fibers components of connective tissue are elongated structures formed from proteins that polymerize after being secreted from fibroblasts and other cells. The three main types of fibers include collagen, reticular, and elastic fibers. Collagen and reticular fibers are formed by proteins of the collagen family, and elastic fibers are composed mostly of elastin. Now, although reticular fibers contain collagen, histologists and pathologists retain the terminology because of the convenience when describing organs or diseases that contain a large quantities of this particular collagen type. Different amounts of connective tissues that serve distinct roles in the body will have different and unequal amounts of these different types of fibers. Thus, the predominant fiber type will give a specific tissue most of its unique properties. The ability of connective tissue to resist tension is due mostly to the presence of tough, firm, inelastic collagen fibers. Collagen comprises about 30% of the dry weight of the human body, making it by far the most abundant protein. Collagens are proteins that also have the ability to form extracellular fibers, sheets, and networks. The various forms are dictated by the role in the body, so for example tendons, are found as tight bundles of collagen. The hallmark of all these structures is that they're extremely strong and resistant to both tearing and shearing forces, which is critical for functions of connective tissue. So collagen is a key element in all connective tissue, epithelial basement membranes, and external laminae or sheaths of muscles or nerve cells. It's mostly produced by fibroblasts, but it can be secreted by other cell types. The collagen family has at least 28 members that have different molecular compositions, morphologies, distributions and functions, as well as pathologies. Now you're not expected to know all of the family members, but you should know the major categories or types and which collagens are the most important in each category. There are four categories of collagens, fibrillary, fibril associated, and two found in basal lamina, network forming and anchoring. Fibrillar collagens, type one, two, and three, have subunits that aggregate into large, flexible fibrils that are visible even under the light microscope and the tensile strength of these fibrils exceeds that of stainless steel of the same diameter. Now we'll get to those in more detail in just a minute. The second category are the fibril-associated collagens that are often thought of as stabilizing collagens because they form molecular bridges between the fibril-forming collagens and ground substance. Third category, network-forming or sheet-forming collagens such as type 4, have subunits that are produced by epithelial cells, and these collagens are major proteins of extracellular lamina all basal lamina, and function to provide support and allow for filtration. Finally, we have the linking and anchoring collagens, which are short collagens that link the fibrillar collagens to one another, which helps them form larger fibers. So now let's talk about the fibril-forming collagens. Type 1 is the most abundant. It forms large bundles that stain dark magenta with H&E and blue with trichome stain. These are the thickest fibers and are found forming structures such as the dermis, the tendons, bone, and organ capsules, places that require resistance to tension. Type 2 is found in cartilage and the vitreous body of the eye, and it functions more to give resistance to pressure. 
type 3 collagen forms thinner fibers that bind silver and are found in skin, muscle, and blood vessels, along with type 1. The function of these fibers is maintenance of extensible organs. So these are the organs that require the ability to expand, such as the liver or the stomach. And reticular fibers are found in the delicate connective tissue of many different organs, such as the liver seen here. That's it for the collagen family members, but I provided a table that summarizes a lot of the important facts about the fibrillary collagens for you to review later. Collagen synthesis is a multi-step process that occurs in different cell types, but it's a specialty of fibroblasts. Normal collagen synthesis and proper function depends on the expression of a whole lot of genes and correct post-translational processing. Not surprisingly, mutations in any involved genes or mistakes in post-translational processing can lead to either insufficient amounts or abnormal collagen synthesis, and this in turn leads us to many different pathological conditions. Understanding the steps of collagen synthesis is thus worth us spending some time on, and not coincidentally, this is also highly testable on step one. So let's walk through the steps of collagen synthesis together using this simplified diagram. So different pre-pro-collagen alpha chains, shown here with the dark red arrow, are synthesized from related genes in the nucleus and translated in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. To then prepare collagen for its final assembly in the extracellular matrix, there are a number of post-translational modifications that have to take place in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and in the Golgi. For example, pro-collagen alpha chains contain many proline and lysine amino acids, and specific hydroxylase enzymes add hydroxyl groups to these amino acids in a vitamin C dependent manner. So lack of vitamin C blocks this step and that can result in disease. Now what disease do you think this is? These chains are also highly glycosylated. Next, three of these alpha chains are selected, they become stabilized by disulfide bonds, they fold into a triple helix. Now this triple helix is called a procollagen molecule. This is the hallmark of collagens, and failure to properly assemble this trimeric structure results in osteogenesis imperfecta, and this can be caused by mutations in a number of different genes. The trimeric procollagen is then further modified, it's transported through the Golgi apparatus, further modified, packaged, and secreted. Now outside the cell, the triple helical procollagen molecule is cleaved to a rod-like molecule. Now we call this tropocollagen. Tropocollagen is the basic subunit from which fibers are assembled. In this tropocollagen molecule, all three alpha chains can be the same, or two or three chains can have different sequences. And it's this ability to have different combinations of procollagen alpha chains that allows a variety of collagen types to be assembled, all that have different structures and properties, just like we talked about in the last couple of slides. Now outside the cell, the collagen molecules self-assemble into fibrils. The fibrils can become stabilized and form even larger fibers, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now this fibrillar structure is also stabilized by formation of crosslinks between the collagen, and this is catalyzed by the enzyme lysyl oxidase. So you should know the basic steps shown here in this diagram. Remember the three or four enzymes that I've talked about and that are shown here, and be able to predict the results of mutations and defects in each step. Now, as I said, these fibrils can assemble further to form large collagen fibers that can become even further bundled, and the next few slides will illustrate that process. First, the newly cleaved triple helices self-assemble into regular overlapping arrangements where the spaces between the head and tails line up as repeating gaps, while part of the head and tails overlap in the so-called overlapping regions. Now, this regular arrangement results in the appearance of light and dark bands when looking through electron microscopy. Types 1, 2, and 3 collagens form fibrils, but type 2 and type 3 stop their assembly at this step, while type 1 fibrils assemble even further to form larger fibers that can now be seen under the light microscope. And those type 1 fibers bundle even further and are linked and stabilized by other collagens. And you can see the striations and bundling quite easily in electron microscopy and also using light microscopy. Here's a brief summary of collagen synthesis. But one last thing I need to mention about collagen is that it's important to note that collagens do turn over and they do renew, but this process is ongoing, but it's quite slow in most tissues, although there can be exceptions, such as in the periodontal ligament. But in order to be renewed, collagen has to be degraded. 
there are collagenases that degrade collagen that are members of the matrix metalloprotease family, or MMPs. And these are responsible for remodeling the extracellular matrix during tissue repair and wound healing. And they are altered in diseases such as cancer. I've included here a few practice problems for collagen synthesis. Try answering a few of these on your own. Now let's move on and talk about elastic fibers, the second major type of fiber in connective tissue. Elastic fibers are much thinner than type 1 collagen fibers, and they form sparser networks interspersed with the collagen bundles in many organs. In this micrograph, you can really appreciate the difference between the two types, with the collagen fibers shown in larger, thicker red, and the thinner elastic fibers in black. Now in this image of the aorta, you can see dark stained elastic fiber sheets that are running between the layers of arterial smooth muscle. Elastic fibers, as the name implies, have properties similar to rubber, allowing tissues to be stretched or distended, and then snapping back to return to their original state when relaxed so much like this rubber band. And the function of such fibers is to add resiliency to connective tissue, but also to maintain the ability of those extensible organs to actually expand and contract. So you'll see a lot of them in organs such as the trachea or in arteries. Elastic fibers are composed of fibrillin microfibrils embedded in a larger mass of cross-linked elastin. And both of these are secreted by fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells in the vascular walls. The fibrillin is deposited and it serves as a sort of scaffold upon which elastin is deposited. So in this EM and cartoon, you can see that the elastin actually ends up occupying most of the center of the fiber, while the fibrillin microfibrils surround the core like a sheath. And you can also see collagen fibers in cross-section outside that fibrillin domain. So what is it that actually gives elastic fibers their ability to stretch and recoil? Part of the answer is that there are unusual domains within the major elastin proteins, desmosin and isodesmosin. And there are unique cross-links between these domains so that the fibers can stretch and straighten under force and then relax. So we know that the integrity of elastic fibers depends also on the presence of those microfibrils. See whether you can predict some of the possible outcomes of mutations in fibrillin. What organ systems might be the most affected? Finally, let's touch on reticular fibers. Reticular fibers are composed of collagen type 3, which forms a network or a reticulum of thin fibers. It's pretty difficult to see in H&E preps, but the fibers stain black with silver salts and carbohydrate strains. These fibers are found in the reticular lamina of the basement membrane and surround adipocytes, smooth muscle, and nerves. They're also found in networks or reticulum that serve as supportive stroma for secretory cells in the vasculature of the liver. That's what's shown here, and also endocrine glands. You can also see reticular fibers in the stroma of bone marrow, spleen, and lymph nodes. So far, we've covered all the fibers in the ECM, but if you recall, the other main component of the ECM is ground substance. So what in the world is ground substance? Well, it's essentially what fills the spaces between the cells and surrounds fibers. It's shown here as a pink background in the cartoon. It can be colorless, such as in blood, or it can stain dark purple, as shown in between these cartilage cells or chondrocytes in this tracheal cartilage. One way to think about ground substance is that it's a bit like a molecular sieve, where nutrients are able to diffuse between blood capillaries and cells. Now, ground substance is composed of glycoconjugates, glycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, and cell adhesive glycoproteins, and of course, fluid. It's responsible for many of the critical functions of connective tissue including resisting compression. So it's kind of similar to a running shoe insert. It's also important for lubrication and attachment and movement of cells within the ECM. We'll start with glycosaminoglycans. These are negatively charged linear chains of repeating disaccharides. The macromolecules have the capability to bind large quantities of water, and most of these are sulfated. And usually these glycosaminoglycans are linked covalently to protein backbones to form these even larger structures called proteoglycans as seen here in the cartoon. So the glycosaminoglycans are the bristles on this very large bottle brush, and it can hold a lot of water. The only glycosaminoglycan that's non-sulfated is hyaluronic acid. It's also the only glycosaminoglycan that doesn't bind to that protein backbone. Even though hyaluronic acid doesn't bind the protein backbone, proteoglycans actually attach to hyaluronic acid to make even larger macromolecules. So here's an example of agarkin a proteoglycan found in cartilage and connective tissue that attaches to hyaluronic acid, which you can see here as the bright blue line. 
And because hyaluronic acid is so long, the result is an aggregate composite that occupies an enormous volume and has an enormous mass. And this is in large part responsible for the gel-like state of the ECM and is particularly important, for example, in joints. Our third component of ground substance are the cell adhesive glycoproteins. These are primarily responsible for the ability of cells to adhere to other components of the ECM, including cytoskeletal components. Further, these glycoproteins can have several domains, one that binds to integrins, cell surface proteins, another one that binds to collagen fibers, and a domain that may bind to proteoglycans. Thus, these proteins can fasten and hold together the various components of connective tissue. Fibronectin is one important glycoprotein that's produced by fibroblasts. It has many roles, including facilitating wound healing, phagocytosis, and marking migratory pathways of embryonic cells. Here you can also see laminin, which is located only at the basal lamina. And so one of its functions is to link collagen and then through the integrins to the epithelial cell membrane. This cartoon summarizes the components of the ECM and how they interact. So given this very intricate structure, it's not surprising that many pathologies result from defects or loss in any of these components. So one way to increase your understanding of the various normal functions of these molecules is to make a Lister chart of potential outcomes for loss or mutation in each component. So that's all for the extracellular matrix, fibers, and ground substance. Thanks for watching.